Okay, so I'll keep mine simple. I raise your glass. I just saw a cute little quote online, um, which I thought pertained to our situation tonight, and it said, "For a balanced life, you need to have a dog to adore you and a cat to ignore you." Oh That's my god, horrible. that's like the so best. Cheers. <laughs> oh gosh, cheers to that. <laughs> okay, we're gonna get to the cats ignoring us in in a moment here. So, Kathy, before we get started, what do all your wonderful letters behind your name, what do they mean? My alphabet soup. Of your alphabet, that's a much better way to say it than what I said. <laughs> it's a lot. We do love acronyms in the pet industry, I feel like. Um, so CPDT and CBCC, those are designations that I um, obtained through the Certification Council of Professional Dog Trainers. Those just stand for professional dog trainer, and then also as a canine behavior consultant. Um, and there's differences between the two. Um, I always consider trainers kind of equate them to like a sports coach or kind of a life coach. So basic skills, so obedience or dog training, um, those kinds of skills versus a behavior consultant dives more into the complex behavioral issues. So things like aggression, things like fear and anxiety, those higher levels. So I, I always equate that to like a psychologist. Um, so those so are those. Which do you things. lean on more then? Cause that's kind of, you got, you got like, do you have a fight in your own head about like, oh, what are we going to solve? <laughs> you know, I, I lean on both equally, I find, but I, over my career, I have shifted more into the behavioral cases. Um, I still take training cases. Everyone needs a little bit of puppy love every once in a while, um, but I specialize in aggression and resource guarding. And so I find I'm, I'm doing more of those cases, but I am using training skills all of the time. You can't really separate training from behavior. Um, so I'm always pulling from both sides of that as we go. Okay, guys, so start bringing in JJ. Good to see you. Um, we, I really want to make sure that we are bringing in as many questions as you guys can think of, but I'm going to actually kind of jump a little bit ahead because we are all facing a, no, I shouldn't, I shouldn't speak on behalf of everyone, the loneliness of our pets. Many of us are starting to leave the house again or have been leaving the house for some time now. So when we have a uh, let's first just do dogs and then let's talk a little bit about cats and the lonely um, household and what we can be doing for them in particular from a behavior perspective because loneliness how does that show in their behavior and then how can we help them yeah so it's, it's interesting to, to think about dogs and being lonely and they can get lonely they're very social animals um, they want to be near us in particular um, and so when we have started going back to the office, we are seeing some behavior issues pop up in regards to separation anxiety. So full-blown panic attacks when left alone or a certain person of that household maybe leaves, even if other people are home, they might be like, I don't want you. I want that one person. Um, so we might see anxiety increase where they become destructive um, when left alone. Maybe they have potty accidents when left alone. But even dogs who don't have diagnose separation anxiety, um, they can get bored, right? So if they're lonely and they're stuck at home with nothing to do and no entertainment, they'll entertain themselves. They'll find something to do. So those tend to be destructive behaviors, chewing on things, scratching up things, um, you know, raiding the trash can <laughs> as you go. So you tend to see more of those kind of foraging behaviors. They're using their instinctual drives of like, well, I'm going to go find something to eat in that trash can or in the kitchen, in the cupboards. Um, wait, wait, can I just interject there is foraging more when they forage more? Is that an anxiety behavior if they don't typically do it? Or is that it's more of a boredom? It's not necessarily uh, related to anxiety because it's food driven. And if a dog is suffering from anxiety, their nervous system will actually suppress the rest digest. So their food drive drops when they're anxious. They're more focused on fight or flight. Oh, and so foraging behavior tends to tell me mm, that dog's bored or they need more mental enrichment. They need more exercise. They need something to do. And so they're just going back to what they evolved to be, which was a scavenger. <laughs> right. So you're saying it's like us on the phone. When we start to get bored, we just go through and we start oh, scrolling. It's their yeah. for we're foraging for content. They're foraging. Yeah. For yes. They're just entertaining themselves. Right. Just like we would be in that scenario. Yeah, I think that's fascinating. So how can we solve that for our dogs in particular? We'll talk about cats in a moment, but let's yeah. talk a little bit about that. 
Yeah. So for dogs in particular, a lot of people are like, well, I'm maybe I just get a second dog. And I'm like, eh, maybe <laughs> that might or might not work. It really depends on the dog. Um, but in all honesty, most of the time, they're really just wanting to be around you. You're the center of their universe. Um, and so adding a second pet or another dog could work, but not always. And especially if we have a dog who has more separation anxiety attributes, adding another dog is usually not what we recommend because then you just end up with two dogs who have separation anxiety. <laughs> so you have to be very careful about how you approach it. Instead, I look at how can I meet this dog's needs when I am home. So looking at, are they getting enough exercise, right? Are they getting a lot of mental enrichment and brain games and giving them an outlet for their instincts to forage with puzzle toys or nose work? Training is great enrichment too, even if it's just two minutes at a time, you know? And so meeting those needs when you are home, that really helps a dog learn that, okay, when they're gone, I'm just gonna hang out and settle. And that's what we want to see a dog do when they're home alone just chill out, just hang out, do your thing. So um, you have one, okay. one tip, just one thing for that couch potato person who after a long day is like, I guess, but we know the dog needs something. What's, what can we do to make sure that we're giving them more? Is it, is it because more snuggles wouldn't necessarily help them? It's always good. They want that contact for sure. But Honestly, the easiest thing that changes pets' lives is increasing enrichment. And I've done this just by making every meal time make it a puzzle or make it a brain game for them. So there's lots of products out there like Kongs and Topples, but you can just use like empty egg cartons, right? Or a cardboard box or packing paper. And you just make it a game for them so that you're meeting that, that mental enrichment need that they have. And that burns excess energy without having to go for an hour long walk in the evening. So I'm Shannon loves you because here. Shannon's never had a bowl in her life. She's only ever used those, uh, those feeders. So she just loves those things. So let's transition to cats because I do know we have Linda on here and Linda loves her cats. Um, and we do too. I'm, I'm just saying, I mean, Oscar was my first pet, but uh, actually the cat was the first pet. We called her the cat. That was so sad. Um, she didn't actually have an identity. So what do we do for like, how do they show their loneliness or their anxiety because we're not in the house as much? Yeah. So cats are interesting. They're, they're not, they're not like dogs in, in how they are social animals. Dogs are very social animals. Cats can kind of take it or leave it. Depends on the cat. Um, and it's, that's a lot of cat behavior. Depends on the cat. Um, but they may or may not benefit from adding another pet to the home, but cats tend to be more solitary overall compared to dogs. And so it, it's not something we see as much as far as behavioral issues because they're lonely. Um, but we might see destructive behaviors, right? So chewing on things, scratching is a normal cat behavior. So it's not always an, an, an indicator that something is wrong or that they're feeling anxious, um, but chewing on things. So destructive chewing, just like dogs. Um, other signs of anxiety in cats going outside of the litter box, right? Spraying, things like that. So, so you, same idea here with cats as with dogs is we look at how can I meet your needs and how can I meet your instinctual needs? Um, and so enrichment, play for cats, um, giving them an outlet for what we call um, the predatory sequence. So they're hunting. Like they a do, big word. It's a big word. But all it means is how do you hunt prey as a cat? And how can I take that and mimic that in play so that you meet that entire need? And it's recommended to do at least one prey sequence with your cat per day to help meet oh. that need for them. So, okay. I've never heard the prescription of one per day. So if I were told, you know, and be like, okay, I can do that. I can get and do the, the playing or whatever. So what is the one, like the best prey sequence that you can do with a cat? What's the best one? With the cat? Oh my goodness. Well, you want to look at how can I help you stock something? So cat ones are really, really good to start with, but then you also want to work through, okay, they see it. So they orient to it, they stalk it, right? And then they're going to pounce on it, right? And then they might kick at it, 
to kill <laughs> the prey. So you want something on the end of that cat wand with some substance, or you switch out to a different kind of toy, like a little mouse toy. And then they work through things like dissecting it, right? And then the prey oh. sequence ends with eating. So the biggest thing here is no matter what kind of toy you're using to mimic the hunt for a cat, you want to end it with actually getting to eat something. So that might be some of their food, or it might be a few cat treats, but you really want to finish with getting to eat so that it closes that hunting process for them. So I was going to say, it's like me going to Target and ending with Starbucks, but that's not quite the same thing. But I, <laughs> one of the things that JJ just said was they need to bite it. Do they, is that like a, 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 they have to, is that a physical thing that they have to be able to do? For cats and dogs. Yeah. Yeah. yeah oh. They need to catch the prey, right? So okay. they catch it. Dogs, the prey, the prey sequence is a little different than cats, but not by much. So for dogs, you might see they catch a toy, like a tug toy, and then they might shake it, right? Yeah. That's the kill bite <laughs> for dogs. And cats have something similar, that, but instead they usually tend to kick the toy, right? To subdue their prey. And then they work at, okay, now I've got it. How am I going to eat it? And then they take it apart, right? And then they eat. So, so you want to really look at satisfying those parts of the, the drive. But I love the prescription of like once a day, really giving that. And um, we know dogs need more than that. So they need more playtime across the board as we go through it. But again, people tend to go, okay, maybe I should, maybe I should get another pet. So how do you know, aside from your own needs, if your pet is telling you that they want a companion, do they tell us, do they actually tell us? say they tell us I think we start to give them like certain feelings about this like well I think you'd like another dog or I think you'd like another <laughs> cat but is that really just us saying I maybe want another pet <laughs> but with dogs it's a lot easier to tell with dogs whether they enjoy the presence of other dogs and playing with other dogs um, because you can go out and have play dates with other dogs you can try out dog daycare see how they do see how they interact with other dogs at the dog park and things like that with cats it's a lot harder um with cats even if they've gotten along well with other cats previously in their life that doesn't mean that the next cat that you bring home they're going to get along with um and dogs can be similar right? Um, they might be like, yeah, I love the last dog that we share this, this home with, but this puppy, no way, right? They all are individuals. They all have their own personalities, likes and dislikes. And puppies, most adult dogs do not appreciate puppies. Um, it's a lot to handle for them. So it took my older girl, I brought home a puppy. She was 12 and it took her about three, four weeks to even be like, oh, I think it's staying. <laughs> so maybe I'll start to play with it. It took time for her to really get used to that. And she'd been a dog who'd go to dog daycare with me every day, 12 hours a day, loved other dogs, loved giant labs. That was her, her favorite dog to play with. But she was also happy just being the only dog. So I could have gone either way with her. So it really is knowing about what does my dog like, right? And if bringing home another pet means that their quality of life is going to diminish in any way, then that's probably not a great idea. So what about like, so you see all these Instagram uh, like posts where people and they've got their little cat hugging on a dog and then they've got the the two, are you just going, don't look at Instagram, Catherine, stay away from Instagram. But they show, you know, this camaraderie and you think, I think my pet needs that. So if, if you do decide, and then I'm going to quickly, after we answer this one, have uh, Shannon, because we've got a few questions that have popped in. But if you do decide to bring a new pet in, what is, and I'm going to talk only cats here, because I think dogs are a little easier, but you can address that one separate. But if you're going to bring a new pet in and, oh, oh, oh my God, Leslie, shows how they love each other. Sorry. I get distracted. I'm just letting you all know, I'm paying attention as you all are doing stuff. So is Kathy, she's watching. So what do you do? What can you do for cats to introduce a new cat? And then let's talk about introducing a new dog. Yeah, um, lots of time, space management. This means really making sure that each pet, whether dog or cat, this is kind of the same for both species, by the way, where lots of, of space. So they have their own safe space where they can go. They won't be bothered by the other, the other pet. Um, they have their things, right? So especially for cats, the big thing is to make sure that there is enough resources for the cats because cats can become very resource insecure um, and they can get anxious when they think, I don't think there's enough 
litter boxes for me, right? Or I can't get to the litter box without the other cat being there. So you wanna make sure there's at least one litter box per cat plus one. So one extra litter box total in your oh, home. Oh, for okay, number. I haven't heard that. That's cool. Yeah. And then you also wanna think about, is there at least one on each floor if you have a multi-floor home? Things like that, because access is a really big thing, thing for cats. So you wanna make sure that they feel they always have access to those things but having their own space where they can go and not be bothered by the other one, right? Especially if you bring home a puppy, give your other pets space <laughs> because they need it. Puppies are a lot of energy, um, but time, right? And separation. I do a lot of scent swapping. So I might, especially if it's a dog and a cat meeting and introducing, but especially cat to cat too, you want to get them familiar with each other's scents before you're just like, here you go, face to face, have fun, right? You really want to take time with that so you don't stress them out. You see, how do they respond to just the scent, right? Do they get really anxious? Do they get really fixated and tight, right? Or do they seem like, oh, okay, cool. And then they go about their day. So that can give you an idea of the pace at which you proceed or whether it's a good idea to keep going at all. We do a lot so of separation. Question. Just real quick is should you for dogs in particular should you showcase which is the alpha dog do you let the the older one or established one? do you need to do that it's a great question so i don't look at it it's you you bring up alpha which is such a dirty word in the industry Catherine. <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> well dealer. i'm a pet parent so <laughs> i love it so what's interesting is it all comes from dominance theory um, which has been disproven as far as how it relates between humans and pets, right? There is no dominance. It's blowing when you're saying it's been disproven. Oh. That's what that means. When yes. I that. Dominance theory is dead, except <laughs> there is this thing with dominance between same species. So between cats and then between dogs, right? But it's very fluid, right? And all it is, is it's about priority access to resources. So who gets that dog bed at this time, right? And they're looking at, mm, you want it more than me and I'm not willing to fight over it so you can have it. So then we label them as submissive, but that doesn't mean that dog is submissive, right? Or alpha or beta, whatever. So when I look at bringing in a new, new pet, one thing I do do is I do make sure that I have the established pets back as far as I'm trying to shake up your world as little as possible. So I still wanna make sure that you feel comfortable accessing your resources as you have been before. Now I might give one dog a treat first, but then I am always following up with now you get a treat. Same thing goes for attention. If this okay. dog gets attention, that means you're getting attention. I just did this with a puppy and a cat in a client's home the other day where I was teaching them. Okay. When he sees the cat get a treat, that always predicts that he's going to get a treat because then that helps prevent jealousy like like <laughs> I'm want... gonna you got something I didn't yeah. get okay, yeah so. but you can switch it it doesn't always have to be one dog before the other but you want to create that association of okay when they get attention I also get attention I can keep my cool I don't need to rush in and get stressed about them so so I don't worry too much about in, like bringing in a new pet and establishing their hierarchy they'll do that on their own and it will change throughout the day it will change as they age and it will change based on the resource whether it's going out the door first right or sitting on your lap versus sitting on the floor they will figure that out so you just have to make sure you're managing that so it doesn't escalate to problems later okay so the chat's been blowing up i don't yeah. know if you've been noticing so i'm gonna let shannon jump in and give bring some of these specific questions forward because we've got quite a bit yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't want to interrupt, but we've had quite a few. Um, so I'll paraphrase some of them. Um, I know there was one a, a little bit back about um, what about pets that are kind of single pet in the household, but they have interaction with other pets through a fence um, or that kind of thing. And they're having issues, you know, they get along well enough, but then when they're, you know, outside, but through their fence, they just kind of go crazy. Yeah. So this sounds, if I'm understanding it right, it's like they do fine until there is a barrier between them, I think is what they're saying. Yeah. It sounds like they're like, maybe, you know, like if you had a neighbor with a dog, so your dog doesn't live with a dog, but when they're outside, they're kind of nose to nose, but have that fence or gate. Yeah. So <laughs> we call this barrier reactivity. Um, and it's very normal uh, to see, especially dogs, I don't know about cats and barrier reactivity, um, but dogs will often become more reactive and feisty with each other when there is a barrier between them. 
This could also be a leash. So I have met many dogs who bark and lunge and freak out when they see other dogs when they're on walks on leash, but then off leash they do fantastic, right? So they're fantastic dogs at daycare. Um, some of this is really just based in frustration of, I'd like to get to you to interact with you, maybe get more information about you, but I can't. And so all of that frustration builds up and it just explodes, right? And over time, frustration can turn into just a learned habit of this is what I do when I see another dog. Um, so barriers can create a lot of interesting things. There's a great video on YouTube, if you ever find it, um, where it's street dogs and they're fighting through a, a driveway gate. And then as the gate opens, they all just stop and look at each other and then turn and go home. <laughs> and it's just, it's crazy to see how, how quickly it switches because the barrier is now gone. So it can certainly be a frustration. Yeah, I totally want to find that video and I'm going to totally post it. That'll be fun. Yeah, I'll yeah. see if I can find the link. I can't remember the title, but it's a great example of that. So it's not always an indicator of, oh, it's going to go bad, but you do want to just be very consci con conscientious of how you introduce those dogs, whether it's that same dog, <laughs> right? Or other dogs, just because you aren't sure, did they learn some habits from that, some learned history that this is now how they act going forward? Great question. Okay, so it's not always aggression is what you're saying. It can just be like frustration or those other feelings. Okay. There's okay. a bunch more. And I know we had, yeah, Christina shared um, that she fosters dogs and her dog sounds like does great with them, um, but she can also tell that he's relieved when, when the dogs go away. So she said that helps her feel, feel out how her dog would feel about having a, like a, another resident dog. Yeah, is fostering is a yeah. great way to see. And then and we always need more fosters out there yeah. for shelters and rescues. Yeah, and a lot of places will even, in my experience, do kind of like a slumber party where you can take the dog for a weekend or something if you want to try it out. Again, different personalities. But all right, let's see what else. There was so much. Um, there was a bit about introducing like puppies to older dogs or dogs of like very different sizes. So any... You know, oh, yeah, that's a good one. That. Like the li if you got a little, little like lap dog and then you got the really big or you got like just a kitten and you're you got an older cat you're introducing and be interested on that. Yeah. So that age difference and then the size difference. So age differences, you really just want to look at. And well, I'm going to start this with something that veterinarians I work with always just drill into me is that age is not a disease. <laughs> oh, so thank just, you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> right yeah so we tell you that <laughs> so I I don't always just to be like oh well just because they're old doesn't mean that they wouldn't enjoy having a younger energetic active you know cat or dog um to share their home with um it can keep senior dogs and senior cats young in a way because it keeps them moving and it keeps their brain engaged um if they enjoy um that other pet in the home but when I'm first doing introductions especially with puppies and kittens they're they're so full of it like they are a hundred miles an hour or they're sleeping, you know? So you really have to make sure that with an older dog or an older cat, that you're not letting the puppy just wail on them or the kitten wail on them because they could accidentally hurt the older pet or the older pet might not realize like, oh, I shouldn't, you know, jump or run like this because I'm going to be sore later. So you really want to make sure you're managing the play if they're playing together um, so that everyone's staying safe and the puppy doesn't become overstimulated and then just, you know, really pester the older pet. Um, so how you really want to- How do you intervene though? I, I hate to interject on that one, but how do you intervene to make sure that they don't think they've done something wrong? Yeah, great question. So I use the fancy term is um, a positive interrupter. All this means for most of my dogs or even the cats that I work with is I just teach them that their name means that I'm having a treat party over here. So uh -huh. with my two dogs, I use the cute puppies if they're getting a little too crazy. And puppies has always predicted, mom just threw some kibble on the ground. So they stop whatever they're doing and they run over and they eat the kibble on the floor. So food, fantastic. <laughs> right awesome you love it yeah. and you're just, just like yeah yeah they hear that word and they go what and so they stop what they're doing and it's a positive association for them um most pets have no idea what no means but we are really good at using that <laughs> and then we get really frustrated when it doesn't work and like our dog is just like oh they keep yelling they must be having a great time with us okay i'm sorry <laughs> i'm just really quick they don't know what the word no means 
No, we can teach them as long as we've also taught them what yes means. So we have to teach them this is what works. And then once we have that, then we can start telling them, nope, that didn't work. Because we use so, the words, the same words we use for our kids, we use for our animals. Yeah. Or vice versa. If you don't have kids, you tend to use no because your boss said something no you wanted to say, but you couldn't. It's a very human thing. And what happens too is I actually use the word oops to tell my dog that they just missed the opportunity for a reward or maybe messed up a little bit. Because when I say oops, I'm not getting frustrated inside as easy as if I was going, no. Right? <sighs> and so I'm managing my own mental health <laughs> with my dogs as I work with them. But well, Linda just, Linda just said her cat thought their name was no for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Could be your positive interrupter. If you just pair it with some food, it'll be great. <laughs> oh my gosh. I yeah. know you've got more questions. Shannon. Yeah, so there's tons. Her. Um, so Ellen wants suggestions um, for managing stress level. It sounds like um, her, her two dogs get along very well, but they went to daycare and were so stressed out that one of them got sick. So now she has a dog sitter when she travels, but wants to know what she can do for managing that when she's away. Yeah. So when she's away. So one, it is finding what works best for these dogs in this situation. Is it boarding or is it like daycare boarding? I actually usually prefer pet sitters in the, in the home. Um, because that tends to be the least stressful option um, of caring for dogs or cats while we're away. Obviously, cats, way less stress to have them stay in their home versus being boarded somewhere. Cats can get separation anxiety, but it tends to be more related to their home location rather than their people. <laughs> so, so having someone stay in the home tends to be the less stressful because that means that they can stay on the, the same routine that they are familiar with. And that familiarity reduces stress because everything is more predictable. They know like, this is the time I'm gonna get fed. This is the time I'm gonna get walked if it's a dog. All of those things are still there at the same time. So it's just fewer things that they have to worry about. Is that going to happen? Um, but if you do have to board or if they have to go stay with a pet sitter at someone else's home, increased enrichment. So really talk to the sitter about here are some puzzle toys for each of their meals, <laughs> right? Give them those mental enrichment activities to do. For dogs, licking, chewing, and sniffing is a natural de-stressing activity. It helps them decompress. Sniffing in particular, there's studies that show it lowers heart rate. So if they're starting to get anxious or worried, letting them sniff. So tossing some kibble into the grass, if you have a yard or going on sniffari, we call it, put them on a long leash, let them follow their nose as long as it's safe. I love a sniffari. I'm going to use that tomorrow because that's all our dog wants to do sometimes. Just take me on a sniffari. Yes, I totally use this. Yeah. No, I love sniffaris. It's how they view the world. Mm -hmm. They follow sense. And so giving them that outlet for that instinct, and then it's lowering that heart rate, reducing stress. For cats, other options can include things like um, uh, feel away, which is a calming pheromone for cats. Um, there has been some good results from studies done on that that could help with, even if it's someone just coming into your home, plugging that in to just kind of help calm the environment for them. Um, making sure they're getting play, making sure they have their cat safe space where they can go, especially if they're like, who is this random person now here, giving them space so that they don't feel overwhelmed with that. Um, for sure. So I'm going to jump in really quick. It's time for the fire hose for you, uh, Kathy, because we have a lot of questions still to ask. Uh, Shanna, how many do you have that you want to bring forward? And then I want to make sure. And again, guys, go to preventivet.com to be able to get access to a lot of resources. But I have a ton more that I need to ask. And I want to make sure because yeah. like at the time. I just have, I think, one more, but there are some good comments in the chat too. But, um, and it was, I think Elizabeth posted, sounds like she's got three dogs in her home. Um, one is kind of the more assertive, gets along with dog number two pretty well, but now there is a 10 month old puppy who wants to rush in and kind of snatch the food from, from dog number one. So what can she do? It sounds like, um, you know, yeah, that's one of our questions too, is this. Yeah. Multiple and, and so people. what can she do to keep the young one from kind of keeping her place, I guess, in the house? Oh, she yeah. cannot separate the dog. Sounds like. So the easiest answer is feeding them separately. But um, if you can't separate them, what do you do? But my question is why not? <laughs> Because that could be... no, I'm just kidding. That <laughs> no, no, but then you do. I have to do a lot of this 
kind of puzzle solving with clients too, because the first thing we do in every, any behavior modification plan or anything for training is we look at how do I change the environment so that the dog cannot practice the unwanted behavior, right? And so, because every time they do it, their brain is going, yep, this is what I do. <laughs> and so we can't make a lot of progress in changing that behavior in the long term if they're still practicing it and then we're competing. So for something like resource taking, which is very similar to resource guarding, they're related, a little different, you really look at one, how do I prevent you from having the opportunity, right? Once I've done that, then I can look at teaching you how to wait, right? Or how to eat your food and then wait while the other dogs are still eating or chewing on their toy, whatever it is. And that's training. But the behavior part is looking at how do I prevent you from doing this over and over again? And so I look at, does one of you eat behind a baby gate in the bathroom while the other ones are eating in their place, right? Especially because we all have lives, right? And there's days where I'm like, I have no energy to train my dogs on this. I'm just gonna prevent it from being an issue by feeding you on different sides of the gate, right? And then if I wanna work on it tomorrow, awesome, right? But I, at least I prevented that unwanted behavior from being rehearsed and being done. So I look so at- So first of all, thank you for being honest that even you have rough days and that is, you're like, I just need to figure out how to handle it. So that <laughs> humanizes, yeah. it's real. Yeah, yeah. Sure. it's hard to be training all of the time, but management's so important because a dog is always learning. That doesn't turn off. They're always making associations, but there's nothing wrong with taking a break and just managing and not training in that moment. So, but yeah, things like baby gates or um, puppy play pens. There's some really nice lightweight pop-up ones now available. Yeah. The bigger dog, it can be a little bit harder, but those are, you can just pop them up for meal times, right? Or exercise pens if you have those or one dog eats outside if it's nice out, depends on the weather, right? While the other dog eats inside. So you look at just ways of how can I at least manage this in the interim? And then over time, we look at teaching the resource taker puppy of those dogs are eating. And as long, I might use a gate for environmental management, but I'm on that side with them and I'm teaching them when they're eating and you're looking over there, but you don't run over. Yes, I'm going to reward you at your food bowl over here. So I'm teaching her do this instead. And then over time, I take away that gate. Maybe they're on leash so that they can't rush over there because they're always faster than we are. <laughs> and I'm slowly working on teaching them that, yep, when other dogs are eating close to you, good things are happening to you over here. So that's fantastic. You feel great about that. But then also I'm telling you, you staying and not rushing, I will tell you, yes, that's a behavior I like. I reinforce it. And then over time, you're just able to work more and more calm and they're less likely to run over and take. I have a resource taker, my younger boy. Honestly, I'm fine managing it for the rest of his life. I feed him in his crate so he eats out in the kitchen, right? So I'm going to, this is not on the list at all. And I only because we know weight management is a big deal these days. And if you have behavior problems with one of your pets mm -hmm. and they are rewarded by food, how are we able to help manage their weight? Because I learned that a milk bone biscuit is equivalent to a Snickers bar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, so that's the first step though, is knowing how many calories are in this treat or this food that I'm using with my dog? So choosing better treats <laughs> is a big part of it, looking for lower fat um, and all of those things. And, and then I look at what can I use their regular food for, for treats? When I'm working on higher level behavior issues like resource guarding or leash reactivity, I am using the good stuff. I'm not using kibble. But when I use the good stuff, I'm making sure that we are taking out some allotted calories from the day from their usual meals. So I'm trying to balance total calories for that dog, knowing that I'm going to increase the amount of high value, squishy, smelly, higher calorie treats. So I'm going to cut back on the other thing. But other things I'll do is I'll look at, does this dog like carrots, right? Do they like really low calorie, healthier kinds of treats that I can incorporate um, into their training? And the other thing I do is I, I make sure that we increase exercise. I feed my dogs a lot of food, a lot of treats, a lot of high value treats, and they're very skinny corgis. And most corgis are fat, <laughs> but they're skinny. So it really is looking at, am I getting them enough exercise? Am I balancing overall calories 
for them? Am I not just adding extra when I'm training? Um, it's just making sure you're balancing that out. So Leslie, I know you love that she has corgis because you just pointed out about yours. Okay, so a little bit of, so we, I'm, I'm watching this. I want to be careful on the time. Okay, the one thing we haven't really discussed and, and Shannon, jump in if you have others, but I want to talk about what species are not compatible. Can we kind of talk about what is not a good match in the household? We know dogs and cats can be compatible, but can we walk through where is not a good compatibility? Yeah, this is such a tough question. So I'm going to give you a brief overview of what makes an animal. <laughs> uh, first, we have learning. So what they've learned in their life, especially early socialization, early learning. Um, then we have environment, what's going on in their environment, right? Then we have genetics. <laughs> then we have self. So we call this legs. The legs of dogs is um, a big thing. Kim Brophy um, is the first one that termed legs, but it's applicable to every species where we look at what's their early learning, what's their environment like, what do they learn from that, what is their genetic predisposition. So this is what really relates to choosing what other pet in the home would work with this animal. So I look at where they are in the food chain <laughs> to start uh -huh. with. So I'm looking at, are you predator or are you a prey animal? Cats are both. So that, why would they make anything simple <laughs> as cats? So, but they switch between both. Dogs are predatory animals. If we really go far back in the evolutionary chain that they're from, um, you know, birds, there's some birds of prey. It really depends on the bird that you're getting. Horses. They are herd animals. They are not out hunting other animals. They are a prey species. So you're really looking at, first off, where are you starting at? Then you look at, okay, for dogs, are you a <laughs> sight hound? Do things running make you want to chase? Does that just hit the right button in your brain that sends you into chase mode, right? Are you a terrier, which is a lot of them are bred to dig and find the prey and get it as fast as they can. So there's different predispositions within different groups of dogs that can help you determine, hmm, well, maybe I shouldn't have a sight hound with a ferret if my ferret likes to run around, <laughs> right? Because that'll trigger a dog. Well, that'd, be to a bad, that'd be a bad one. That's yeah, so you're looking at that. But that's not always true for every dog. There might be a, like a sight hound who grew up with a fuzzy rabbit and they, because of that early learning, they're like, yeah, no, that's not, I know that thing, right? So there's, there's things that can make up for certain instinctual drives, but you always want to be aware of those things and then use that to weigh, okay, what would a good option for this be? So Marcy pointed out her dog, her cat and her bunny all get along. Like, yeah. I think, I think it's, it's, it's fun, but how quickly do you, can you assess, can you assess an individual pet to see where they might have like challenges with other species. And Elizabeth's so cute, so cute. <laughs> As a consultant, just because I've had the experience over the years, I can usually tell within one or two consults of whether like that dog will do well. So for example, there was one not too long ago for me where they had chickens and then they adopted an adult dog. So this is for adult dogs. If it's a puppy, it's a little bit harder, right? Because regular puppy behavior is I run and I put my mouth on everything, <laughs> you know? And so that doesn't tell me like, yeah, that dog is super high prey drive and gonna, you know, chase the chicken, whatever. It's just being a puppy. So it's hard to separate what's what for the younger dogs. But for adult dogs, within about 20 minutes of seeing that dog's behavior around those chickens, I've said, not the best match doesn't mean that you can't work on it, but there is high risk. And so your management needed for the environment is very high for a long time while you work on getting this dog more comfortable, keeping their brain around a prey animal, all of those things. So it doesn't mean that it's not workable if I have a not so great prognosis off the bat. That prognosis can always change based on how the environment's being managed and how much work they're putting in to changing that kind of behavior. But prey drive is hard to change, right? What's cool is that different breeds, we've We've just fiddled with the prey drive, herding dogs. We were like, yes, I want you to, to eye that. I want you to stalk it. I want you to chase it, but don't bite it, right? We don't want you biting the sheep. 
So we fiddled with that, but then other breeds, we fiddled with other things. So there's ways to work with it, but it takes a lot of commitment as you go. I love, I love it. And by the way, we're getting, now we're getting to the fun part. Cause this is people are like, my dog does this, my dog does that. Okay. So I know we're coming close to the end and I know we didn't get all the questions asked, but this is why we love the conversations that we have because we're not going to solve them all in one. Um, and also I love to talk about target. So apparently that can distract a lot of people as we're going forward, but I do want to talk about this one in particular. So we see when we're with a individual pet, whether it's a dog or a cat, they're demanding our attention. Sometimes another pet can come up and be a little bit more aggressive saying, no, it's my turn. I want to have time with Catherine because she's so awesome. So I just wanted to know, how do we manage that? How do we make sure that both uh, pets or three pets or four, because now the average household has more than one pet. How can we manage that and make sure that they're getting the interaction that they need? Yeah, so I like to to really think about making sure that each pet gets some one on one time with their people every day, even if it's just a couple of minutes each. Um, for me, I walk my older girl on her own, and then I walk Fozzie Bear separately on his own. One because I want that one on one time, but also because he is way faster than her and more athletic, and so she's twelve, so she can't keep up with that. So also for exercise needs, I split it up. But then I get one on one time with them each, right? And then I train them separately a lot of the time too, especially if I'm teaching Fozzie something that Suki already knows. So I'm looking at what are easy ways to get one-on-one -on -one time. It could be a two minute training session with just you, right? Or I go on a 10 minute walk with just one of you instead of a 20 minute walk with both of you and just switch out, right? So making sure you're meeting that need to have that, that social interaction, that close interaction with just you. Um, but as far as managing like, okay, like one pet is like, get out of my way, that's my person. I really try to teach them not pushing in gets you what you want. So I play one for you, one for you. It's a great game where I teach them. I think I mentioned this earlier. If you get a treat, that always predicts that you get a treat, right? As long as you're sitting over here and not pushing into this dog. So I might start with the dogs on totally opposite sides for me. One dog gets a treat or one dog just gets attention. And then the other dog gets attention. And then I switch it up. So they start to learn, okay, I can handle it. And then I start working them just closer and closer to each other. Okay. I'm also making sure that like, if I'm on the couch and one dog wants to come up and sit on our laps, our dogs do this all the time. That if the other dog comes up, I make room for them, right? So I'm not kicking one dog off to make room for the other. I'm making sure they both get some, right? And managing that space for them. Okay, um, I got to ask this question because it came up and, and it was meant to be a joke, but it's not a joke. So someone asked, wait, your Fozzie didn't tr uh, train your other dog. People have this perception. So can we, so I know this, again, sorry, Anne's going to have a heart attack. We like plan for it all. And I come up with everything else. So this notion that people go, I've trained my older dog yeah. and that dog's going to train. Does that actually happen? Or that cat will train this cat, how to use which litter box, whatever. Can does that actually happen? If only it worked like that, like our lives would be so much easier. Yeah. So rarely it happens. <laughs> um, there, there is something that we call social facilitation, which is between species where like one dog watches another dog to do something and they go, hang on. Pat's got a cute photo of her dog. Sorry. Just have to interrupt when people show their pets. I got to show. I got to <laughs> Yeah. So social facilitation, we use this where a dog learns to mimic another dog. So, but that's happening all of the time. <laughs> so if, if we have a dog who's like pretty good, right. But there's some things that they do. And if those things like barking at people at the door, those things are self-reinforcing. If it's fun to do that, if it's somehow rewarding the dogs, the new dog is going to be like, this is awesome. Right. So they think this in this household. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you have to not rely on an older dog to teach the new dog. Also, it's not their job. They didn't ask for you to bring another dog home and then to train it for you. And if they did, then the dog would only listen to the other dog and not to you. <laughs> so it really is the human's job to show the dog the ropes, the new dog the ropes and be like, these are the expectations. I'm going to reward you for things I like. I'm going to manage the environment so it's not easy for you to make bad choices right? I'm going to teach you alternative behaviors to do instead. 
it really helps the older dog too. I found that when I brought Fozzie home, I started training Suki more each day just because I was prepared to. And it kind of, it was just a great bonding experience because she's like, you're training Fozzie in that room. And then I give him a chew and then I train her. And it was just really great bonding for us, even though we had this obnoxious new puppy at home. Oh, that's um, really cool. Yeah. So you really want to spend time one-on-one -on -one with the dogs and an older dog isn't going to train a new puppy. If anything, the puppy will just learn all their bad habits, but <laughs> So we are coming to the, uh, so any last minute question, Shannon, because I want to be sure that we are able, guys, this is why we do this. This is why we have the conversations. Thank you to Preventivet and Kathy for being such amazing, like jumping in and going, I don't know what this all is, but sure I'll show up and, and uh, get to see them all. And you guys will see the chat as we go through, but there's quite a bit here. Shannon, anything? Yeah, I think we've covered most of the big ones, but I did want to just touch on, I know we've kind of focused on cats and dogs tonight and Elizabeth has her guinea pigs on and we know we've got other pets too. So do you think a lot oh, of- Oh, there are, I missed them. Kind I of, yeah, them. yeah. Oh, she's so switching them out. Um, but a lot of this, you know, can we say that it pertains to other pets too in terms of the intros and the spending time with one and then the other and that kind of thing? Or is that- Definitely, expensive? definitely, yeah. Okay. Like, we want to give our pets that- that one-on-one -on -one time that they one come to expect, but also they need, right? Um, so that they can be happy and healthy. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we're giving them time to acclimate to changes, uh, especially ones that they didn't really have a choice in, right? A lot of times we bring home a new pet and we might not know, like, did you actually want this, right? Which is why foster, foster to adopt, fostering just to see how a, a dog or cat does, really, really good intro. But yeah, any species you wanna make sure you're meeting their needs, and then slowly acclimating them to the changes as they go. But especially for species who like guinea Marcy pigs. And her bunny. Right? Sorry, oh, we have yes. a bunny too. We got a bunny, we got the pigs, we got the whole, we got it all. I yeah. will say, Elizabeth, hers are therapy guinea pigs, which oh, I, I think that. are amazing. And so it she brings another layer onto everything that we do. And oh my God, Marcy, I haven't seen that rabbit, but that is a beautiful looking oh, rabbit. Here. The big eyes. Yeah. But like, especially prey animals like that, making sure that the environment is set up so that they aren't stressed um, because stress can really affect their health, um, especially rabbits as far as they are more health. impacted, right? They're like their environment more impacts the stress on them can physically impact them. Correct. That's more of a Shannon question. Yes. Yes. Bunnies are super sensitive. So yeah. yeah. So making sure that they're not just overwhelmed and that their environment is still feeling safe for them. Yeah. Yeah. Time, time and separation and slow introductions. So guys, I do want to make sure. So this is, as you know, we love doing these conversations. I thank every one of you for always coming and joining us as we do these. And thank you to preventivet.com for also bringing these things forward. But more importantly, oh my God, look what we found in Kathy. Like, oh my God, she's amazing. So we want to be sure that we are going to give her a closing toast here in a minute, but I do any final parting questions, guys, put them in there. We will send them to Kathy. And so she can help provide any answers so that you guys would all have them as I go ahead and get this video up for you all tomorrow. But I also, for all of our cat lovers. So next week we are having another conversation, but cat behavior only. We're going to ban the dogs. We're banning them. <laughs> And we're only going to go into cat behavior because they, they are the most mysterious species on the planet. I truly do believe it. And even if you don't have a cat and you've always been fascinated, now is the time to come and join that conversation as we do it. But again, thank you, thank you, thank you to Preventivet. I guess Christine asked, do you have any mentorship or courses for other trainers? Ooh, do you teach? I, I do mentor. I do a lot of mentorships with other trainers around the country. So a lot of them are virtual. I'm up in the Seattle area. So I have a few here locally that work with me um, in shadow cases, um, but also virtually. So always happy um, to, to help people wherever they are. But I also highly recommend a few different programs. Karen Pryor Academy is an amazing program um, to get deeper into training anything by Michael Shikashio, if you're interested in like aggression work, which is like my passion. Um, so there's lots of resources out there, but um, are you going to have some contact info for me if they wanted to email me later? I'm happy to, 
to connect. I will absolutely send it out to the folks that registered. If you are willing to give out your personal, I mean, for your uh, contact on that, we always want to be careful because our people love to ask a lot of questions. That's um, great. I love talking but, animals, so it's good. <laughs> well, and the fact that you get to have a glass of wine when you do it doesn't make it too difficult and people get to show off their beautiful cats. I mean, look at Colleen, like, come on. I mean, come on. We love the pets. I mean, it just makes the life better. Now people, oh, and you know, we got, just love it. So now that those of you who've never been to a bridge club before know that if you show off your pet, you're obviously going to be called out for it because we love it. We love it. We love it. So we are at the ending toast here. So I'm going to turn it over to Kathy and make sure that she, who has her alphabet suit behind her name of all her credentials, because she is awesome sauce. And again, thank you to Prevent Vet for bringing us, Kathy. But let's let's end with a great toast tonight. Yes, first, thank you everyone for joining. I had a great time on my first one. Um, but really just a toast to all of the animals we love, their ability to bring us together and their ability to show us what love is, whether towards us or to the other pets that they share their lives with. Cheers, Cheers. everybody.